Let us pray together. Our Lord, we do come before you this day, acknowledging you as the immortal, invisible, God only wise. You are the sovereign one enthroned in heaven, the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the redeemer of your people through Christ Jesus. We come today recognizing that you are most holy, wise, and perfect. All your many attributes that you've revealed to us in Scripture. And we come today humbly as your people to acknowledge that, to ascribe to you all glory and honor and praise. We receive our worship, even as we come um, inadequately. And we would ask that by the presence of your Spirit, you take hold of us and enable us to worship in the right way, in spirit and truth, in a way that is fitting and acceptable in your sight. Help us to put away the concerns of this life, to look to you as those redeemed and clothed in the righteousness of Christ, empowered by the Spirit. We come in faith, desiring you, loving you, and worshiping you this day. For we come and we lift up our prayer and praise in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the back of the hymnal, page 871, we're going to use a couple of the catechism questions again to um, confess our faith, to make profession or confession of what we believe. We've been gradually going through some of these, sometimes uh, intermittently, but um, the uh, catechism is really an instructive tool, but we're told by, the, by our church that it's an appropriate way to, in corporate worship, to um, to confess, make declaration of what we believe. Of course, when you do that, you're only picking out certain things because the questions are divided up. So on page 871 of the hymnal, uh, it's question 29 and 30. Uh, after uh, covering questions about who Jesus is as the Christ, the fulfillment of the great offices of prophet, priest, and king, uh, and the one who's the mediator of uh of salvation, the, the only mediator between God and man, and that he has done all this, then there's these questions. How does this come to us? How do we receive it? So 29 and 30 refer to our receiving redemption, uh, recipients of redemption. So uh, I'll read the questions. We'll together read the answers, question 29 and 30, as we confess our faith. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? We are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us by His Holy Spirit. How doth the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? The Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ by a work of faith in us, and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual call. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Uh, of course, what follows then is questions about what is effectual calling and such, and it keeps going as we uh, talk about the various aspects of redemption, such as justification, legal righteousness declared through Christ. He's died to pay the penalty for sins, he lived righteously. That is counted for us when we have faith in him and adoption, sanctification. Some of the other things are following. So, uh, but today we, uh, we are recipients uh, of a salvation that is by grace. It's like a gift. Like a gift handed out. How do you receive gifts? You stick out your hands and you take it and you say, thank you. That's how you receive gifts. And that's what the gospel of the Lord Jesus is. God has brought Salvation by sending His Son, and we receive it by faith as a gift. Um, scripture reading, page 820, back a few pages, Psalm 97. Uh, really reading some of the Psalms in this section, uh, especially declaring and recognizing God's uh, rulership, I guess uh, rule and reign over creation, over over the nations, over the peoples, uh, and affirming that. Uh, there's something wonderful about that in the chaos of a world that you, you don't know what's going on, what could happen. 
it is certainly good to know that um, the Creator uh, and Redeemer is enthroned and ruling and reigning, and we can put our trust there. So let's uh, read responsibly here. Read the light print. You respond with the bold as we read Psalm 97. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the existing shores Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on his side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all the heavens. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. Light is shed upon the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. May the Lord have his blessing, the reading, the understanding. May we continue to call the Lord in this way as well, and also live uh, in accord with that expectation. He rules in power. He reigns as a sovereign, and yet he's also reigning in righteousness and goodness and justice. And uh, we should be devoted uh, to lives of righteousness and holiness as well, for his name's sake. Um, often, uh, I have chosen to sing uh, 521 as we close communion, because I think there's no, uh, I, I mean, there's several hymns that could be used um, but when you come to the table, uh, it is an appropriate response to realize that your hope is built entirely on Christ as you've just partaken of the supper, is to know that uh, life is imparted in Christ. And it's very vividly displayed in our receiving the elements uh, by faith. And so I've always done it. However, it's uh, good to not only do it at the end of a communion service, but to sing it because this uh, in the middle here is our hymn of affirmation to affirm our trust in Christ as the solid rock uh, who establishes us and secures us as God's children. So how about we sing 521? You, um, you know, we can't sit on this one. you got to stand as you're able because we are standing on the solid rock here. So uh, let's stand together and let's sing uh, 521. <laughs>
all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated and we'll turn our attention uh, to the prayers, um, pastoral prayer, lifting up our needs uh, to the Lord. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we are grateful for the, the marvelous privilege we have to come before you, to lift up to you our burdens and concerns, um, to seek you. To ask for you to come in and to intervene in the midst of our lives. And also uh, to continue to seek you as um, the one who is sanctifying us, uh, bringing about a greater degree of holiness as you're doing your work in us. We pray that even today, as we've met, as we've worshipped, as we've looked into your word, as we've uh, opened our mouths to utter your praise, and now as we lift up the concerns of our hearts before you, that we would actually have been um, sanctified, that that work of sanctification would be part of this, helping us more and more to put away the sin that so easily entangles us and to more and more resemble the holiness of the Lord Jesus. We uh, need you, and we need you every hour as the hymn says, uh, we know that um, you impart life to us through Christ and the working of the Spirit to do so, and we would we long for that. It's so easy to be pulled away, the allurements uh, of the things of this life and world, even things we must have and, and things we must and, and enjoy as gifts from your hands can still be disproportionately loved and desired, and we, we would pray that you help us to keep our desires in check, uh, to appreciate the gifts of God in the way they've been given and to not elevate them to a place in our lives that they should not. Help us to keep Christ preeminent and the things that are imparted as the things from his hand, and to live faithfully and help us to use gifts to not only glorify you, but also to bring blessing to others, especially the church family, but to, but to all uh, who we may bless. We uh, um, marvel at the grace that's at work in us, and um, we would ask that you continue to be at work to, to grow us in Christ, to grow us up in him, that uh, not only as followers of Christ, but those who are united to him in faith, we would exemplify those beautiful attributes of his love and compassion and his uh, commitment to righteousness at every, at every turn. Um, or uh, be with those who are part of this church family who are ailing, suffering, going through uh, various medical um, situations, um, treatments, uh, watch over us, your people, and especially them. We're told, as Jesus says, the, the good shepherd is one that would walk away from the, the 99 to go find that one that has wandered away. Certainly there's an attention and a concern over each one. Uh, we're also told that the good shepherd knows his sheep, and the sheep know him, and we know the voice. And... and um, he knows us by name. You know us by name. We are particular and we are special in your sight. So for each one who is suffering, we particularly appeal to you to, to go and to care for that sheep, for that lamb, and that um, you would uh, bind up their wounds, provide for them all that's necessary to endure what they're going through. Grant to them healing from your hand and a strength and a, and a stronger faith and dependence on you even as they're weakened. We have several who are dealing with ailments, ongoing chronic illness or enduring uh, harsh uh, treatments. Uh, we know some have very serious illnesses, uh, but uh, we call on you. We seek you to sustain us and to sustain them by your grace. We would uh, also pray that you would be at work in all of us, uh, drawing us up in Christ, um, that we will indeed be uh, spiritually 
uh, stronger and growing in every circumstance of our lives. We're dealing with the various decisions of our daily lives. And even there, uh, you are with us to guide us through in the various relationships that we have, that you would be there uh, prompting us, um, prevent us from sinning and so violating the royal law that says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbors yourself. And often the, the, the neighbors that we show the, the least love to, the ones closest to us, the ones that we would say we love the most, forgive us of that. Cleanse us that we may truly love, love as Jesus has, in sacrificial giving of ourselves to one another in the church, in our homes. Help us to exemplify that faith in the world, in our workplace, and in the various places in which we affiliate with others who don't know uh, and do, do not have and share the same faith and perspective. Help us to show the beauty of this kind of attitude and prevent us not only us in this particular place, but your people as a whole from availing or distorting agape love in Christ. May we be those who exemplify what is true love, what is truly a concern for neighbor. Um, and um, in that way, share Christ with our world. Lord, we pray that the truth of the gospel will be held up and held out. Give us opportunity and give us courage to present to others who Jesus is in the gospel, the good news, that we're all sinners. But God sent his son, and he's done everything necessary to overcome our sin and to reconcile us to God through faith in him. He lived for us a righteous life. He died to pay the penalty for sin. He was raised to secure our salvation and to give us hope and to impart to us eternal life. And he's now ascended to heaven to rule and reign by his word and spirit. Help us to share that story in the way we live and how we speak and share it with others around us. And make that gospel bear fruit here and around the world for your name's sake and for the blessing of your creatures, your people, all over the world. We love you. Thank you. Hear our prayers. Answer them according to your goodwill. For what is good for your people and what brings glory to your name. For we come and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As the ushers now to come as we worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Stand for the box song.
for every gift, material and spiritual, that you pour out upon us. We bring these offerings, not only in obedience, but to show our love to you. We would ask your blessing upon them to make our ministry effective in this place and to support um, the efforts of the gospel mission to the ends of the earth. Lord, well, we come making our offering of prayer in Jesus' name. We taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And let's turn to Colossians again. Today, as we're making our way through this little epistle, perhaps one of the one of the ones that may be kind of overlooked somewhat. Not overlooked, really, but just not the first one to think of when you think of Paul's epistles. Again, I'm not sure that the church at Colossae was a small church necessarily. I don't really know the size, the numbers that were involved, but it's certainly Colossae had kind of... Uh, had its heyday in, uh, in the time of uh, the, the apostles' writing, they had become less significant in relation to other area cities. However, Epaphras had heard the gospel in Ephesus, brought it to Colossae, and it was uh, bearing fruit. And uh, Paul was, has written to them so far, we've seen where he's giving thanks for that, and then last week he's praying for them. <clears throat> he's praying for their continued strengthening. And I read, last week I read down through 15, and I ended that sermon by kind of suggesting kind of the foundation of what will prompt these, uh, our, our praying and our seeking uh, spiritual strength. And, and what, what supports that is, I mentioned the inheritance that we have in Christ, and also just a realization of, of this gospel deliverance. Uh, there in verse 13, he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness, that is of sin, and the things that are against God and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. We've been brought into a kingdom uh, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, uh, the Son He loves in Christ. He sent Jesus for that very purpose. He now rules us and He's brought us out of that. And I also read the next one. I intended to include another great foundation is that in, in, in that supports, it's a founding truth that would support us in this effort in spiritual strength is this, is that our faith is established in the eternal Son of God. So today, we're going to start 15, and we're going to dig into that. We're going to look deeply into it. Now, there are many, many aspects to what the Scriptures teach, what God has revealed, what we hold to and believe in this Christian faith. And by that, I mean there's, you know, there's all sorts of ethical teachings moral, you know, expectation. There are, there are doctrines and truths that we summarize so that we know correctly how to conceive of God and of Jesus Christ. There are expectations of how we're supposed to conduct ourselves, you know, we gather and assemble to read the word and preach and teach and worship and, and sing our praises. We're given all those sorts of things. And all of them are important. But there's the thing that is central it's not thing at all. It's not, it's not about things at all. It's about things, things to do, things to know, things to assert. Although they're very important. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm just saying, but they're not, they're not the most important. The most important thing in our Christian faith is not a thing, but it's a person. That the, that the focus of it the centrality of our faith is not on things around or supporting or even the, the things of telling us what it is. It's a person, and that person is the beloved Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's where Paul gets to in verse 15 and what follows here. I'm going to read it, but get you ready for it. When we're about to read these words, we are taking our lens and we are focusing in the very epicenter of our, of our faith because we are turning our attention to read and understand who is 
the Lord Jesus Christ, that we affirm, believe in, trust for our eternal destiny. Let me read. I'm going to go through 23, starting in verse 15. Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. Give attention. This is the Word of God. He, okay, this is following the verse about His beloved Son, the Son He loves. He is His Son. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You could say bond servant. Amen and amen. This ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless it to our edification this morning. Christian faith is about Jesus. We're told in the book of Hebrews, not that long ago, I, I went to that text and said, um, considering the great cloud of witnesses, that is, the many through church history that we can look to as examples of true faith and trust in the Lord, since we have a great cloud of those who testify to Jesus as believers, <clears throat> let that prompt us to turn our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfect of our faith. Yes, we must study doctrines. Yes, we must exegete scripture and try to dig in and understand it properly and articulate as best we can. One of the most beautiful things in going through seminary education was to, it was to learn to be precise in my theological thinking and statements. To understand those doctrines well. Yes, there is divine law that's been given. God has revealed what is right and what is wrong. And we must study, we must proclaim that. But there is a way to get distracted by all those things and miss the main point. That is the main point of loving, believing, trusting in faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. In him is where all the divine things are truly accomplished and made known to us in the, in the most vivid way and we must turn our attention. And that's where Paul goes in this little epistle. He has thanked God for them, that the gospel's gotten to them, and he's grateful for it. He has prayed and, and announced that he prays for them regularly, for their spiritual strengthening through all knowledge and depth of insight of the will of God. But then he turns his attention and says, he is the now. Most likely, he goes in this direction. Because there's an awareness, if you, if you study the epistle carefully, uh, there will be points where you realize that there are some probably teachings brought in by some who were beginning to challenge some of those basic things. And they were especially challenging or undermining the belief of who the Lord Jesus Christ was. Um, as I mentioned last week, um, it's likely that not during uh, the time that the apostle was written, but possibly a hundred, hundred, more than a hundred years later, a, a system of philosophy that was very theological developed called Gnosticism. Uh, some people think it was already in play and that's what he's writing against. I think the best understanding now is that 
some of the ideas were around, but it didn't really develop fully. It had a lot of mysticism to it, and it, it integrated a lot of Jewish ideas. And they thought that there was secret wisdom, but they, it was a dualistic idea. And, and here, in this section here, when it starts to emphasize near the end, his redemption and the reconciliation that was bought by the shedding of his blood and the, uh, the reconciliation through his physical body through death, then they're certainly addressing some ideas that were being presented that somehow maybe he wasn't really fully a physical human being when he came. And yet the apostle is wanting to make sure that it's clear and he's pointing this out. But especially in questioning whatever these ideas were, in questioning anything about the Lord Jesus, Paul was compelled to want to make sure, I must make sure you understand who he is properly. That's what we're trying to learn here. Uh, the importance, the supremacy, the preeminence, whatever words you choose, is presented to us in living color right here. Bold and direct. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's where many who just can't, who can't accept it fail. And here's where those of us who have accepted it and received Christ know that this is our hope. This solidifies our hope completely. And it starts like this. First, first is, the, is the importance of Christ and seeing him as fully divine. Fully divine. He's spoken of here in the, in the highest terms in connecting him with God and identifying him with God. This, this would be Paul's version of what John writes in his gospel when he says, In the beginning was the word, and he's using that term logos. And as you keep reading, you find out, well, he's talking about Jesus here. Because he says the Logos took on flesh. In the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. There's a distinction, and yet there's an equality. <coughs> Blows our minds, doesn't it? We don't have categories for that sort of thing. That's why people, some people struggle with the doctrine of the Trinity or the dual natures of Jesus Christ. But here, it, you'll see, this is one of the places it is clearly set out. You know, Paul didn't believe that at one point. You know that, don't you? When he was Saul, and he was, he was infuriated at these people who were following this thing called the way. And he got authority from the Sanhedrin to go around and take these people and throw them in jail. I guess, the, I, you know, I never thought about this. I'm going to throw you in jail until you renounce all these silly beliefs you have. And one day he was on his way to Damascus to do this. Read about it in Acts chapter 9. And a blinding light from heaven knocked him to the ground. He says, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. Now, by the way, he wasn't persecuting Jesus. He didn't have any idea Jesus was of any importance. He thought he was the guy that they put to death. He says, you're persecuting me. Why was he persecuting? Because he was persecuting his people. That's how, that's how closely identified faithful, believing people are with the Lord Jesus. We're considered to be united to him in faith. That we are personally united and connected. Paul didn't believe this. And now, listen to what he's saying. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Okay, now there's various ways that God, there's different aspects of God's nature that's revealed. But one of the first ones that we know, I, th I think probably one of the ones that is most easily attributes or qualities or uh, roles or however you want to name it, that we recognize deity is through creation. Through creation. And by the way, everybody believes in a creator. I'm going to say that. Everybody. Well, what about the atheists? What about the Darwinians? How about the, the people that have a, something? And Carl Sagan did not, uh, declared the cosmos all it, it all, it's all it is, all it ever has been, all it ever will be. Well, there was something. 
And he was affirming that as the ultimate, even if it was matter, energy of some sort. He was saying the physical is the eternal, and that is what has brought about everything. He believed in the creator. He just didn't believe in a personal divine being behind it all. Paul did not believe that Jesus was identified with the creator. Being identified with the creator is one of the easiest ways. Romans 1 says something that, you know, that the nature of God, his divine nature and eternal power is clearly seen by what has been made. When we observe, I mean, do you ever just, don't you, don't you ever feel like you ever study you know, an astronomy book or just, just sit out at night and when it's a clear sky and you're looking into the stars, don't you, don't you get the sense that you're gazing upon this incredible thing? And it's way beyond us, way beyond us. So to see what and how everything has, has come together, works together, is orchestrated as incredible harmony in how it works. And I don't know, I understand. Yes, there are things that are all messed up. We have a doctrine that explains that too, by the way, called the doctrine of sin, the fall. Uh, but there's clearly the handiwork of God as creator. And that's where he starts with this. Not only is the, the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. And by the, by the way, notice he doesn't say the, he says the firstborn of creation or over creation. Okay, that's an important distinction. I'm talking about theological precision. And here's um, orthodox Christian uh, understanding of the, of the person of Jesus Christ is this. His essence as a person was eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He existed as a person. Okay, we're seeing some of that laid out right here in these words. He is the image of the God, first one. His, he is, uh, in, that, in that situation, he's eternally begotten. He was never created. He didn't have a beginning point where he was created. I don't know how to explain that to you because there's, nothing, there's no illustration in physical form in our experience that is eternally generated from, you know, from something else that's connected to it. We only know generation or birth or, or you know, multiplication or reproduction from something that, that connects and it produces something entirely different. And then each of those have their own finite reality. The Son, in His essence, is eternally begotten or generated of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is eternally proceeding from them. They're bound up three in one, one and three, equal in power and glory, distinct in how they function and operate and work. However, they are unified and one in every way from all eternity. Now we can say that, but mentally to conceive of that and to illustrate makes sense of that. So we're looking here upon what it's saying about the son, the firstborn, not the first creature, not the first one made, the first. Born, that is the, the position of, of privilege and preeminence that the first point is, but the, but the regularly and eternal generation of the Son. It's over creation. In fact, we're told, for by him all things were created. Uh, sometimes they, they would say it this way to make sense of it. God, the Father, is creator in one way, but the mediator of creation, actually the mediator of creation and the mediator of redemption is, is the Son. The Spirit is the applier of it, the one who's executing it and bringing it about. You know, even at creation, we're told that the Spirit of God hovered over the deed. So we, we get hints, even of the complexity and the, you know, of, of the nature of God even then. Here, like in John's Gospel, we're told that the Son was there. He is divine. He's fully, how, I mean, he goes on to say other things, but he's... By him all things were created. And it goes on. Things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities. Now some think that, that those four things are just variations of referring to the spiritual beings and realities. I'm, it could refer only to those or it could refer to anything that we give and attribute power and authority to even in an earthly way. Because it does say the visible and invisible things. It's not only the invisible. He's over all of it. He's created it all. 
the power over all of it. All things were created by him. And then it says for him. In other words, he's the one, he's, he's the beloved son along with the father and the spirit is, is part of uh, creation, mediating creation, causing it to happen. And yet it's also for him in the sense that the goal of it is found in him as well. The goal of all creation is somehow pointing toward him. Now, how can, could you say anything? I mean, there's various ways to say it. But the Apostle Paul is, is taking a sledgehammer right here, and he's driving home some important points about what they're to know and understand and how they're to relate to Jesus Christ. And there's no mistake. He's speaking in the highest possible terms of linking the beloved Son in a united way with the Father, with God. He's fully divine. It continues in 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things. Now, it's going to transition here to something else. However, it's very evident. Paul's wanting to drive that home. Now, if for some reason these false teachings coming in were to try to detract people away from holding a high and holy and glorious view of the Lord Jesus, he was, he was nipping it in the bud right there. Here's who we're talking about. This is who we serve. This is the one in whom we have been delivered out of darkness into his kingdom. He rules us and reigns, and here's the position he has. Here's the importance. Here's the supremacy. Jesus Christ is the image of God. What in, uh, you know, in a abstract way we think of God when he came and put on flesh it was a form a body was observed to display to us the creator God and of course even after his death and his ascension we have the witness to who he was and, and Paul is hammering away at that making sure it's there you know the statement that that uh C.S. Lewis wrote about it. He says, there's only really three options. Jesus is either a lunatic to, to, for him to claim the things he did and for his apostles to claim the same things. He's a lunatic. Or possibly he's a liar because it's deliberate to say something that's contrary to what he said. Okay? Jesus himself said, you know, before Abraham was, I am. He, he clearly identified himself as I as linked up with the great I am, God, the eternal one. He's either a lunatic, a liar, or what? What's the other L? He's the Lord. Because what Paul is writing here is truth. And what Jesus claimed is truth. We've accepted him as Lord. The Colossian Christians accept him as Lord. And Paul's trying to make sure they are not going to turn away. Because you know what? This, this, this is not, it's not small things we're affirming here. These are huge things. Sometimes I wish it was just as simple. Well, you know, just kind of, why don't you read the Sermon on the Mount and see about Jesus' nice and comfortable teachings about how to carry on with life. Actually, they're not very nice and comfortable. They're pretty radical. That's who he is. And it focuses. And now, here's where it comes to us. It's like, here's where it comes. There's two parts. The second is his headship over his people. Okay, when it says he's the head, he's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead. And then there's also, when you get down to the bottom, it's more about the, his role in reconciling us. God's creatures in his image who have turned and rebelled in sin, how we are reconciled to the holy God. And it's, where does it come from, through? It comes through him. It comes through him. The eternal God is reconciled to a sinful people because of the beloved son in whom the full image of God, the fullness of God dwells and he brings God to us and he brings us to God. That's what's the picture here. Let me go through it. His role and importance and supremacy over his people, and especially in fulfilling 
all that was needed for salvation or redemption, whichever term. Salvation is to be delivered from peril. Redemption is to be purchased out of a bondage. 18, and he's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning of the, and the firstborn from among the dead. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, if it's not true that Christ is standing over them, we, we're to be pitied above all creation. Because what we're preaching is just nonsense now. We're putting our hope in a man who was crucified as a criminal and who died and he, and he had no significance. The resurrection was key. A divine act of life out of death in order to conquer sin and death. That's what they were proclaiming. That's what he said. That's what the, that's what the disciples saw. Is it a miracle? Absolutely. It's a miracle of all miracles. Can we explain it? Oh, we can't explain it in our terms. No. The disciples just witnessed it and it changed their lives. And here Paul is reiterating. He's the firstborn from, you know, Paul didn't see him in his human resurrection. He saw him in that glorified state on the road to Damascus. And he, he immediately changed from an enemy of Christ to the great missionary who was willing to go to great lengths and to die for him. Why? Because it all started there. The redemption is really solidified and, com and, 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 and completed in the resurrection. So he identifies him as the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything, he might have the supremacy. So then it goes on to explain this further. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to re reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, if there was a temptation to want to somehow make Jesus some kind of ethereal, you know, spirit or misty figure that moved around on the planet, uh, he's making sure to understand, no, he reconciled through his blood, he had blood, and it was shed on the cross. He suffered in that way. It was a physical atonement. He suffered. But the purpose of it was, was reconciliation, to reconcile himself to all things. Now, the reconciliation that follows that he describes is much more personal and very direct to us. That's, that was the overarching plan. Through his bloodshed on the cross, being the first one from the dead, he's reconciling all things. But now, let me tell you how important this is. You were once alienated. That's where it goes in verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's what? Physical body. To once again, combat these uh, uh, docetist views. It, it, later on, there's, there's your docetism. He seemed to be human. It's a, the, the, uh, that word is a Greek word meaning to appear or to seem a certain way. Uh, but now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. The reconciliation is very direct. It's not just this broad thing. Jesus did something and now it's just in place, this, this, um, this broad and diffuse thing. No, it is, it is applied very directly and personally in people's lives. And he's saying, you were once alienated and now you have been reconciled. God has reconciled you through him to himself. The eternal Son, all eternity in existence, puts on flesh. The full image of God is visible. He carries out this incredibly important, significant work. Why did he do all that? To reconcile human beings to the living God. See how he's the focus? You see why it's so important to turn our attention to him, especially? You realize, you realize we could teach and instruct all of our children and raise them up? And teach them to obey certain things here and there. And if they don't come and turn their attention to the Lord Jesus and, and, and know him in this way, they're not Christians. They've not, been, they've not been reconciled. The following of practices and rules and laws will not do that. Paul made that clear, actually. It's not through law that we're redeemed. It's through Christ that we are reconciled to God. It's through our reconciliation and the change that takes place. Then, then the outworking of that is a different way of life a different way of practice and conduct that flows out of that. <clears throat> you were once alienated, but you've been reconciled through his physical body and cross. So all of the atoning work of Christ is made, is made, uh, is, is, is made known here 
even though it's done in a little different way. You know, if I were to do it, I'd summarize it from, I'd start with his birth, who he is as the divine Savior, and how he lived righteously, maybe throw in a few examples. Then we then get to the point where he's rejected and handed over and put to death. And that death, even though they thought they were punishing him for being a blasphemer, it was God's set purpose. That's what Peter said in his Pentecost sermon. No, they were really just doing what God intended for him to come and to be condemned as a criminal to bear sin. So his death wasn't like any other death. His death was actually there to, to uh, bear the penalty of sin. And he died, and it seemed like an ordinary consequence, but his resurrection, as Paul wrote in Romans, settles our justification. If he stayed in the grave, then we assume he's just like the rest. He needs to be saved from sin and death. But by his victory, his divine, powerful victory over death, then we see, oh, he's the conqueror. He's the redeemer. He's the savior. And then he appears and then he ascends to heaven. And he's at the right hand. That means he's in the place of preeminence. He's in the place of privilege. He's in the place of power. He's restored to a glorious, sovereign position. He never left, his sovereignty never left him. He just moved position, heavenly position to an earthly position. Now he's back in the heavenly, ruling over us. And it's centered on the beloved son. That's where the focus is. Now, don't get me wrong. Studying the moral teachings of Scripture are important. Knowing the doctrines and being precise and laying them out to, to have a proper explanation is important. Applying all these truths in our lives, in our, in our work, in our relationships, in the way we get involved in public affairs, yeah, it's important. But don't let those important things overshadow the most important. And that is the focus and the attention and the commitment to the beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When it gets right down to it, that's where it all comes together. Our love and devotion and commitment to Him is to be complete. He's the one that holds the supremacy. The one who rules and reigns over us and leads us in his faith. There's a great temptation to want to diminish who he is. There's a great um, temptation to want to kind of overlook some of the things that are hard to accept. The moment you do that, such as the divine nature, such as the miracles, such as whatever, such as the hard teachings. You know, he said some things that a lot of people don't even believe he said. Man, did he really say that? There's a church a few years ago put up one of those statements. I didn't come to bring peace. I come to bring a sword to divide people. Like, people were asking me at a baseball game. I said, I think they just made that Bible verse up, didn't they? He said, no, it's there. <laughs> I don't know why they picked that one. That was a weird one to put on the board. Maybe to just get attention. Uh, but it was a hard statement. Uh, he said some hard things. It, it's, it's great. We can't do that. God has made himself known and he's, and he's given us his son, the image of the invisible God, all the fullness of God in him. That's been revealed to us. It's been preserved for us to know, to know him through his word, the written word, but also to know him as the spirit makes him known to us. We must hold on to him. We must exalt him. We must recognize him as the supreme one over us, just as Paul has laid him out here. Or if we do, then we are also diminishing the reconciliation, the reconciling salvation that he's given us as well. We're taking away from it. And God has gone to great lengths to bring it to us. So we need to take it as it is. Love and trust and receive the Lord. Jesus, as he's given to us in scripture. The beloved son, the image of the invisible God. Um, how about we end in rejoicing in him? as king, and then by that we mean our sovereign, divine king, 310. Uh, let's
about 1, 3, and 5? Let's sing together. Let's stand together affirming and exalting Christ, the highest place in our praise.